do have a word that I, I just felt the Father pretty powerfully put on my heart just yesterday. And this is one of those going back into the Jesus parables again. I'll meet you in Luke 18 in just a moment before we dig into the text. I, I want to just give you a couple of thoughts to think on and to chew on. And then we get into a, a, a Jesus parable commonly called the Pharisee and the tax collector or the Pharisee and the publican. And I'll get into the details of that in a moment. But we live in a, a, a time when self-help is really popular. I think it has been for at least a generation. Some of the self-help books are always on the top 40 bestsellers. And we're in a time where you can probably help yourself to information better than you've ever been able to before because of technology. You can, you can learn how to do anything on YouTube if you have to fix something on your car or fix something around your house. I know I'm not really good at fixing stuff, but guys on YouTube are. And I can go look up a guy and watch him do it. And then you can watch him do it as many times as you need to. And you can hit pause right in the middle of it. And you can rewind 15 seconds. And it's perfect. You got, the, you got an expert in your house that fixes stuff. And you, you just copycat. And you might be able to pull it off. Uh, we live in an era where you can get more information than ever before. And you can do whatever you really put your mind to do. And if you work hard enough to do it. And because of that, we've all had that for decades now, really. And at least a decade. And, and, and in a world where we are kind of success driven because why wouldn't we be? You can do stuff, so you should do stuff. Um, and that's caused us to have little mantras about surrounding ourselves with successful people and be near visionaries and create the world you want by changing your circle of friends and get better influences. You know, don't hang around with losers, hang around with winners. If you want to be a loser, hang around with losers. If you want to be a winner, hang around with winners. All those things are kind of par for the course, kind of the way we talk. Um, be careful with it. I didn't say throw it out, but I say be careful with it. Because if you live your life in that system, which I think is the system of the world, it's not the system of the kingdom, which is always be around successful people. Because if that were the system of the kingdom, Jesus did it wrong. He surrounded himself with a little a bunch of losers. And then he hung out with publicans and tax collectors and kids a lot who couldn't bring anything to his ministry, by the way. They're not very good givers. And you don't build a church out of it. And yet he surrounds himself with all of this. And so it's not the kingdom way. Again, I'm not saying throw it out, but be careful when you get infatuated with being around only the successful, only the good, only the highly moral, only the upstanding citizen. Because when we're in that mode, that could be a strategy that limits us in a way, because it could limit us to people who easily become their own God. Because whenever it's all about success, and it's all about winning, and it's all about being good, it's easy to feel good when you do good. And you distance yourself from the parts of society that aren't winning, the parts of society that don't do well. It's why in our surround yourself with success mentality, the parables of Jesus seem archaic and sometimes a little silly. He elevates the wrong people in his stories. We've done a few of these stories over the last few months here where the right people are coming to the party and then Jesus doesn't commend it, but he rebukes it. Not the kind of party we would throw is the kind of party Jesus says is what heaven looks like or what the kingdom looks like. And so I think the reason why those stories start to feel odd, even to the point of sometimes abrasive, the parables of Jesus is because maybe that's the first indicator that we've so surrounded ourselves with this win now, be successful, pick the right crowd mentality, that the parables of Jesus seem as if they're not speaking to our culture anymore. They're not really speaking our language. Well, I don't know, to be really honest with you, I don't really know the language of the success in the world. I know what it sounds like, but I don't really know how to speak it. But I do know the language of success in the church. I was raised in the church and raised around pastors, raised in ministry. And the language of success in the church isn't that much different than the language of success in the world, to be honest with you. It just couches itself in religion and morality. But it's still a bunch of get ahead and be successful and build something big and be ambitious. Sort of the same stuff, often masked in religion or high morals and, um, and in that way kind of applauded and amened in much of the church. 
And so while I may not have the lingo, the language of the system of the world, I do have the lingo, ling, lingo and the language of the system of religion and what it means to be, to try to do good and what it means to try to get ahead in the realm of righteousness or goodness. And that looks a lot like some of the parables of Jesus too. And so whether your lingo and your language sounds a lot like the success of the world or your lingo and language sounds a lot like religion, I want to show you a parable that I think speaks directly into who we are. And I want to caution you before we read any of it. This is one of those parables where you got to be really careful because I'm learning this. I didn't say I've learned it. I say I'm learning this. When you think upon your first reading that you have something figured out is when you should pause, read it again, and just remind yourself that it's surely not that easy. All right? And I don't mean you got to make everything tough, but sometimes we've already got stuff figured out the second we read it. We've even got it figured out before we read it. And that blocks us off from learning anything new. Because how can we learn anything new if we're not asking any more questions? I mean, I already know what this means. And so I'm really only kind of reading it just to get my brownie points of reading my chapters today. I don't have anything new to learn in this story. But I'm finding that that's the first sign that there's probably something else there. And as you know, based upon our past together and based upon this lengthy introduction, there's going to be more than meets the eye to this parable. Now, I want to read one verse to begin with. What's interesting about this verse is in this entire story, this is the only verse that isn't Jesus. This is Luke. These are words written in black. Now, you may have a hard copy that has words written in red. I'm reading from a words written in red copy. By the way, that doesn't make your Bible right and other Bibles wrong. I've heard that stuff too. These Bibles that don't have Jesus' words in red, man, find something else to get mad about. I mean, you know, Jesus' words weren't, they didn't come out of his mouth in red. And so that was just a tool. It was just a study tool. So that's not a big deal. But if you are into that whole thing, this verse is written in black. What that means is this verse is Luke talking. Whereas the parable, which comes up in the next verse, is Jesus talking. And I only point that out. I'm not trying to be obnoxious. I simply point that out because of all of the parables I've read of Jesus, I don't know of another parable that says as much in the intro as Jesus says in the parable. That's tough to do. But I think Luke pulls it off. And here's what I mean. Luke 18.9. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. And you might notice there's a colon at the end of that verse because the parable that follows is Jesus doing what that verse said Luke said he's going to do. What does he say he's going to do? A parable about those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they despised other people. So before you even start reading, you already know what the parable's about, right? I mean, G Luke gave you a description. He goes, here's a parable about this topic. And even in light of that, I still want to say be careful. Because even though Luke tells you what it's about and you don't even need to be, you don't need to be a genius. Luke told you what you're about to read. I still say be careful. Because will oftentimes land on a character or land on an outcome and there's more there than meets the eye. So let us, let Luke lay out our three principles because I think this is a three principled verse. Look at the kind of people Jesus is talking to. One, people who trust in themselves. Two, they trust that they are righteous. And three, they despise other people. Now, if you didn't preach any other verse, which wouldn't be smart because you got a parable coming up that actually helps explain that verse. So we will read the parable, but not yet, okay? Because I want to lay some framework. I want to I show you what I think Luke's laying out there from a New Testament perspective. And then I think it'll make it easier when we actually get into this parable that is pretty familiar. So let's deal with Luke's three points. People that trust in themselves, people that trust they are righteous, people that despise others. And I start by telling you this. Here's an overview in case you forgot the Pharisee and the tax collector. It's a parable of two guys that come to the temple to pray. The Pharisee prays out loud. Boy, I'm glad I'm not like that guy. And the tax collector beats his chest, refuses to look to heaven. He's humble. 
And God ends the parable. Jesus ends the parable by going, which guy's justified? Okay, remember the story? Two guys praying. One guy's self-righteous. The other guy's humble. One guy leaves justified. The other guy leaves condemned. Spoiler alert. The guy that looks the best leaves condemned. The guy that looks the worst leaves justified. It's not really a spoiler. You know where Jesus is going with this. He always sides on the side of the marginalized and the outcast. He's not going to swap it up right here. But what gets lost on us is this sounds like a parable of humility. That what We think that what Jesus is trying to do is tell you, be humble in life. That the problem with the righteous man is that he's not humble. Righteousness has not made him humble. But I'm here to present to you that I don't think Jesus is giving you a humility parable at all. I think Jesus is giving you a religion parable. I think Jesus is warning you, not of pride, but of the righteousness that comes from those of us. I said us, and I'll actually just say me. I won't even include you. But for the guys like me who have used religion to define them, who have used being good old boy to determine that we're going to be blessed or determine that we're going to be anointed. I think Jesus is telling a religion parable for all of us religious people who take pride in our religious practices, who take solace in our religious practices. And he stacks us up against a publican, the worst of the worst. And at the end of the day, we're going to lose. And we know it when we read the parable that we're going to lose because the Pharisee's going to hide behind his religion while the publican's going to have nothing to hide behind. And God, in the end, is going to demand that you have nothing to hide behind. And so we're going to walk away knowing that religion stinks and that the liberty is found in having nothing to hide behind. And then we can walk away with nothing more to learn in that except don't be religious. But no, oh, there's more than meets the eye. So let's work on Luke's description, shall we? Look at the first one. Those, this parable in verse at 9 is about those who trust in themselves. Let me give you an idea about what the Bible thought, Old Testament, because we're living in a world in this chapter in which people are thinking in an Old Testament paradigm. Go to Proverbs chapter 30, and I just want to show you the, the Hebrew proverb book, a book of Proverbs that helped guide their day-to-day -day life. And listen to Proverbs describe that person that trusts in themselves in Proverbs chapter 30, verse number 12. There is a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet is not washed from its filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty or arrogant in the Hebrew, how arrogant are their eyes, their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are like swords and whose fangs are like knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. Now, I want you to just think with me in a, in a, for a moment about that phrase, there is a generation that's pure in their own eyes. There is a generation not washed from their own filthiness. There is a generation how lofty their eyes, their eyes are arrogant. We're not talking about the young people. When we start thinking there's a generation, we always think generationally. Those kids that were born in that year or this generation that was born in that decade. This isn't what we're talking about, that there's a generation that's that way versus my generation that's not that way. Because if you noticed, the generation that's causing the problems is always not your generation. <laughs> Notice that? I'll tell you what's wrong with this generation, but it's never what's wrong with my generation. It's always what's wrong with that generation. They're typically the generation younger than you, by the way. The generation that was the problem was never the generation above you. They were great. The generation that you're in, you had a bad break, but you know you're pretty good. The generation right below you, yeah, they're not too great, but they're not so bad because they came from us, right? It's the generation past that, those bunch of losers. They're the reason the world's going to hell in a handbasket because they've got this whole thing wrong. That's not the parables of the Hebrews. When they say this generation, when, when they said uh, there is a generation, it's there, there, there are a people. And you know what? Maybe that people is me sometime. But there are a people who think their way is right. There are a people who lift their eyes arrogantly as if they've accomplished something. There are a people who, as Luke said in Luke 18.9, trust in themselves, who think that they can figure it out. And so 
I don't want that to be them tonight. I want that for a minute to be us. I want us to own that, that sometimes we trust in ourselves. I, I, I don't want to point it off on another generation. Let us just consider ourselves that generation. Have you trusted in yourself ever that you could do it, that you would at least try first? Or how many of us, when we think that isn't us, because I know that Sometimes we don't think that's us, but let me prove to you it is. Have you ever ended up in prayer and said, Lord, I'm desperate. I've tried everything. I need you to do this. Have you ever wondered why you bothered to tell him what he already knew? And that was you've tried everything and now you're turning to him. Lord, I've tried everything. Now I'm turning to you. It's a little bit of an admission of, I thought I had it figured out. I had a bunch of stuff I tried. I threw everything but the kitchen sink at the problem. And now I'm down to you know, fasting and prayer. So if there's anything left for, me to, for you to tell me, tell me now. And so we've all done that. In fact, it's kind of the default religious position. Help yourself as much as you can. Turn to the Lord for what you can't help yourself with. And I, and I realize there's utility in helping yourself because you, you got to. You got to do what you can. But to trust yourself that you are the answer for the issue, well, we've all went down that road and it ends in disaster. And the book of Proverbs agreed. Now, what was the next one that Luke said? Not only is this parable about those who trust in themselves, this parable is about those who trust that they are righteous. And I present to you that the great problem the Apostle Paul noticed when he started to preach the gospel of grace to the early church, and I'm talking the church of 55 AD, 55 to 65. Paul's dead around 65. The real push of the Apostle Paul's ministry is somewhere between 53 AD, 65 AD. In that window of over a decade, uh, and his salvation is probably somewhere late 30s, early 40s. Then he gets shipped off because he's such a problem in the book of Acts that the church actually kicks him out for a while. <laughs> and he goes and learns the gospel of grace, and he comes back a tempered man. And that last 10 years of Paul's ministry, he tries to land on. You only got 10, 12, 15 years. Your writings are going to change the world. What do you focus on? You know? So Paul decides, I'm not going to focus on teaching people how to keep the feasts. I'm not going to focus on upholding natural Sabbaths. We're not going to focus on teaching you the proper day, to, day and way to be circumcised. He starts to kick out all of the natural stuff. He starts to kick out all the religious stuff, all the formulaic stuff. And he starts to land on a righteousness that looks a lot like Abraham's. And Paul really teaches us that the new covenant is a renewal of the Abrahamic covenant. That God took that covenant he had with Abraham and he did this. He put better promises into what was already a great covenant. He took a great covenant and he made it a better covenant. Better covenant built on better promises because it was all through the man Christ Jesus and none of it through you. Well, that's good news. That nothing in the covenant depends on me. Everything in the covenant depends on Jesus. And then Paul realized through, his, through listening to the Spirit and as he presented that gospel, what we often call the gospel of grace or the gospel of finished work, what Paul realized is that the great enemy of the righteousness of God is not the devil. How many of you realize the devil can't do anything with the cross? He didn't stop Jesus from resurrecting. What power does Satan have? Completely crushed at Calvary. So what's the problem? And Paul spotted it. I'm the problem. I do more than the devil could ever do to hold back the realization of the righteousness of God. I don't, you can blame the devil all day long for your lack of knowledge about righteousness, but the Apostle Paul disagreed with you. He does not write to the Roman church or the Galatian church or the Corinthian church. Our problem's the devil, and we need to cast the devil out. And our, we got to get him out of our houses. we got to get him out of our homes. No, Paul keeps pointing back to us trying to keep the law and be righteous and us being religious and us full of performance. And he's like, if you could get rid of you, and your issues, and your trusting yourself, and you thinking you're righteous, he goes, all of that other stuff could begin to take care of itself. Well, let me show you what that looks like. Look at Romans 3. Now, Romans is a book we can get lost in. It's deep. It's wide. It, it, it covers the gamut of righteousness and justification. But I want to show you just a few verses, beginning in verse 10 of Romans chapter 3, where the Apostle Paul lays this out. As it is written, I hope you realize when you see as it is written, we're quoting the Old Testament, okay? As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. You might write this in your margin somewhere. He's actually quoting the book of Psalms, the 14th chapter. 
He's quoting the book of Psalms, the 53rd chapter. There's none righteous, no, not one. What he's establishing is that none of us, no matter how good we are, can be considered right in the eyes of God based on our goodness. That's righteousness. Right in God's eyes. He says, none of us are righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Notice that Honestly, we would disagree with Paul in verse 11. There's none that even seeks after God. We go, come on, man, I've been seeking after God my whole life. But Paul's, Paul's theology, grabbing the Old Testament was, not only are you not righteous, when you think you're seeking after God, I argue that you're not actually seeking after God. You've made yourself God. You're seeking after your own ability to perform up to the standards of God. And only God can perform like God. So every time you seek God through your own performance, you're seeking your own Godhood. And Paul goes, none of you have ever actually sought God God's way when you seek God through your performance. And that looks a little bit like, hey, God, haven't I been reading a lot of my Bible lately? Didn't I pray extra in the offering last week? Haven't I witnessed for you, Lord? Don't these things count for something? Aren't you considering me good and right and holy and righteous? And you know that the answer to that is no. None of those things make me good or righteous or holy. And Paul goes on. Look at verse 19. I know we could keep reading, but I'll get lost in a lot of these verses. So let's jump to 19. Same chapter. Romans 3. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, watch this, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Everybody's guilty before God. The law demands it. Because the law tells you, thou shalt not, and you have shouted. (laughs) Thou shalt not, and you did. Or thou shalt, and you didn't. And if you did it once, boom, you're done. The law declares you're guilty. Now, that's not a real hard thing for us to swallow. You know you're guilty. I mean, and I'm preaching to the choir. A bunch of people in here that accept Jesus as their righteousness. All right? But let's just keep walking through this. Even though we know we are His righteousness, let's keep walking through this. Because I want to show you in some ways it's easy to slip back into that mode of thinking you can do something to get some brownie points from God, even though righteousness doesn't come through your own stuff. So Paul writes this, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, verse 20, No flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. By the deeds of the law, nobody gets justified. That means even if you did the right thing, it doesn't count. By the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified. If you did the right thing, it doesn't count. This is why you better be careful when you tell God about what's fair. All right? This is like I raised, when I raised my kids, I always told them, don't ever come to me and say something's not fair. I said, I'm just helping you out because the world's not fair either. Life's not fair. And grace is not fair. So don't go to your heavenly father and ask for fair. Go to your heavenly father and ask for merit and grace. Don't ask for fair. Fair's not, fair's not what we're working for. Fair's not what we're going to get anyway. And you want to know what unfair is? You did the right thing. Don't get any points for it. And that's what Paul said the whole world is under. He goes, doing the right thing doesn't get you any points. It doesn't get you any points with the world. Actually, I would say this. It actually does get you points in the world. That's actually the system of the world. Do this, 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 and this. Boom. Get this and this and this. That's where we got the unfair thing. It's because we got used to getting our rewards from the world. I did the right thing. I'm supposed to get rewarded. You're right. That's fair. Here's what you deserve. And we go to God with that attitude. And God goes, well, I don't play fair. I don't play fair either way. I don't give you points for being good. Oh, good news. I don't knock points off for messing up. That's the golden side to this. That's the, that's the righteousness we're heading towards as we read this. So even doing the good, no flesh is justified. 21. Now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, and it's being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. Let's stop right there for a minute and basically just say what Paul says in a nutshell. Now if you want to know what righteousness looks like, don't look at the law. Don't look at if people are doing good or if people are doing bad. Just look at Jesus. 
Righteousness now comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.23. There is no difference. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Would you agree? Simple, right? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What's the next? Did you, I don't know if you're looking at your copy. I hope you are. I want you to notice there's not a period at the end of verse 23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's not a period. So why did we break the verse up? I think it's because we struggle with verse 24. And before, I'm not going to read 24 by itself. All right? I'm going to read it as one big sentence. Listen to the end of 22, then 23, then 24. There's no difference. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace. I'll say it again. Listen carefully. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace. Did you catch it? Okay. Let me break it down. Who all has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? All. Who, who all are justified freely by the glory of His grace? It's the same all. So the Apostle Paul gets us out of the realm of performance and into the realm of grace. And he goes, now God's righteousness is wrapped up in Jesus. And everybody has sinned and fallen short of the status of the righteousness of God. That's what sin did to us. But everybody is justified freely in Christ. As many of you as have sinned and fallen short of the glory are also justified freely, where? In Christ. Christ makes you justified to the extent that sin makes you fallen. If sin works to the point that it makes you fallen, Christ works to the point that He makes you justified. You don't do it. Christ does it. You don't make yourself justified. You don't keep yourself justified. Christ makes you just. Christ keeps you just. You don't keep anything. Christ keeps you. This is why Christ said, you're mine and no man plucks you out of my hand. What I grab a hold of, I keep. I justify freely. Justified freely. And that word freely, it means what you think it means in the Greek. It sounds a little better this way though. Justified without cost. I love that. You've been justified without cost. Now it doesn't mean it didn't cost God anything. It means it didn't cost you anything. What does God ask from you? Just believe on me. You believe on me, I'll do the work. I'll do the work. The work of reformation, the work of justification, the work of righteousness. All of that, yours. Now Luke said this. We're going to go back to Luke in a second, but just listen for a moment. Luke said this. Jesus told a parable to people who trusted in themselves. I showed you that according to the Hebrew book of Proverbs, there are always going to be a people who trust in themselves. So we've probably been there. So the parable might be about me. And he also told of people who thought they were righteous. I know that's been me. I don't even have to ask. I don't even have to wonder that's been me who thought that my stuff was stacking up in heaven with God. And he was pretty proud of me and was pretty excited he had Paul in his camp because I'm a winner, you know. And he's good, good thing he's got me. So I've been that guy. And then Luke said, the parable is also for people who despise the others. And that's where I like to jump off the train. You know, I don't want to be, I'm not that guy that despises others. I mean, it's one thing for me to say that I thought I could do it. Sure. It's another thing to say, I thought I was righteous a time or two. Absolutely. Despising others. Come on. That just sounds awfully hateful. I mean, I've been religious, but I'm not going to be that third guy. And what I've learned is if you can acquiesce to the knowledge that you're the first two, don't jump off the train. The first two made you the third one. That's the trick in this parable. 
that if you are the person who's right in your eyes and can do righteous, by default, that turns you into the kind of person that judges other people. By default. You can't help it because you've embraced righteousness through performance. Like a warm blanket. And the minute you put that warm blanket on, you spot blanketless people. You're good at it. You spot people who don't read, don't fast, don't pray, don't give, don't go, don't live for God, don't knock on doors, don't evangelize, don't have the gifts of the Spirit, don't talk to God like you do, aren't as sold out as you are. You can spot them from a mile away and you call it the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I know I've stood in pulpits and did it. I can spot those that aren't living for God. I can tell you the sin you're committing. And the more that we get involved in that world of I can do it, I am righteous, the more we start to despise those who don't live in that world. Why does it seem like when you get around Christians who are moralists, they are judgmental? Because there's no other way to live if you're a moralist. It's in your DNA. If you are righteous by your works, if you can do it, then those who can't do it aren't worth your time. And if you hang out with them too much, it might even rub off on you. I mean, you're in the, re you're in the rewards business, man. You're in the living right business. And if you get around these people living wrong, it might rub off on the way you live right. And you, can, you ain't got time for that game. If you're stacking up points with God, we don't have time to move the yardage stick backwards. We can't make up for this. We only have so many downs. We have to keep moving ahead. We don't have time to get around those who pull down our morality. Now, I hope you are ready for the parable of the Pharisee and the publican because, man, what an intro Luke gave you in three points. Or at least we helped Luke give you that intro in three points. So let's go. Luke chapter 18, verse number 10. I'm going to read it straight through two men went up to the temple to pray one a pharisee and the other a tax collector also known as a publican the pharisee stood and prayed this with himself god i thank you that i am not like other men extortioners unjust adulterers or even as this tax collector i fast twice a week i give tithes of all that i possess and the tax collector, standing far off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And that last phrase has caused us to do what I said we do with this parable. We think it's a parable about humility. Jesus is simply trying to tell you to be humble in your righteousness. Be humble in your goodness. If you can't be humble in being righteous, you'll get knocked down a peg or two. And at least if you're going to be a sinner like the tax collector, at least be a humble sinner. Because if you're a humble sinner, then there's some sort of exoneration that comes through the power of your humility. And I don't want to poo-poo humility. In fact, we're going to land on a humility verse when we finish this. But I do not think that this parable is trying to promote humility, particularly because Luke told you it's not. Luke told you it's about people who trust themselves that they are righteous and despise others. And he said, let me introduce you to a story in which there is a Pharisee and a publican. And I want to concentrate for a moment on the Pharisee with a few shocking details. Number one, we universally approve of his morality. This Pharisee is a good guy. Now, I know we don't think of this because, like I said, we read the parables with the ending in mind. We pick out the villains and the heroes really quick in the parables. And we know the Pharisees are the bad guys. And so we automatically sort of look down on him. But I just want to describe to you what kind of man we're dealing with here. He shows up to church regularly. He fasts often. He pays his tithes to the penny. He doesn't commit adultery. He doesn't extort his neighbor. And he, prov he provides justice all around him. Not only is he highly moral, he's exactly the kind of guy we want in our church. That's, I don't even think we can argue with that. I mean, if you were going to start a church, if you had one of these guys, pretty good start. What if you had two or three of them? What if you had eight or ten of them? 
It's like I don't cheat, I don't steal, I pay my tithes, show up to church, and I open my prayers with, I thank God. That's how he prays. I thank God. We go, this is my guy, man. I built a whole church out of this guy. I thank God that I don't do that and that and that. And I thank God that I do that and that. That all the glory goes to God for all of these things that I do. Not only would we approve of his morality, not only do we hope he signs up, please come to our church, not somebody else's church. But he's not a hypocrite. Jesus doesn't say he's lying. We expect that the story goes, yes, but behind the scenes, he was actually a mean dude who ripped people off and crushed them. And then he came into church and acted like he was moral. And we would read that story and go, that hypocrite, he needs to die. I'm with Jesus. He don't deserve to be justified. But on the face, we can't really figure out why he's not justified, at least not in the code of morality. So here's the warning about the Pharisee before we compare him to the publican. The comparisons are pretty obvious, but I want to point out some things that sometimes are easy to miss. I know I already jolted you by telling you he's the guy out of the two you'd want in your church. But as you sat and thought about it, you agreed with me. I could see it. You thought, yeah, I mean, the church would be better off with him than those crazy tax collectors because wait till I describe you what their day to day life is like. And then you go, is that what we want our church to be full of? I mean, at least we could deal with the Pharisee or at least he'd help pay for the building. You know, we pay some salaries. We could do some good with all the bad he drags in. But what are we going to do with the dregs of the tax collector? And the Pharisee has the most dangerous thing of all, at least. I think in this day and age of ultra-fast communication, the Pharisee has the lingo. He knows how to say it. Because he knows how to say, I thank God. Even though if you read his prayer, he's not thanking God. He's thanking himself. I thank God that I don't do this and this and this and this. I thank God that I do this and this. And the reality is, is I didn't need God to do all of that. I did all of that. That's why I'm bringing that to God. I'm actually reminding God of all of the good things that I do. Have you ever done that in prayer? Lord, I did this this week and this this week and this this week. You know, I just know that you're, you're going to move on my behalf. And that's us kind of stacking our goods up in front of the Lord going, hey, I know you know, but I just want to make sure you know. Like, I, I know you got it. I know you're God. You see everything. I just want to make sure that you know that I did this and that, you know, you, you get all the glory. When, and re, you get all the glory. And in reality, it's, it's sort of, I get the glory and I'm waiting on the paycheck. But the Pharisees got the lingo, man. Be careful of lingo-based Christianity. Because we get fooled by good lingo. We get fooled by good lingo that quote the right verses, put up the right slogans on their campaign posters, say the right things in their rallies, and we walk away and go, how could you say that? If you're not the real deal and Jesus spends his entire ministry standing against people who know the lingo, but don't know the heart of God. Now, maybe this is more important to me because I'm actually in pulpit ministry, but man, I take this lingo stuff pretty serious because I found I know people that know how to spew it out. And then I meet them outside of the pulpit and find that they don't really care about people and that people are means to an end. But man, they got the goods. People go, gosh, that guy can preach. Man, did you hear what he's, did you hear that sermon? Did you read so-and-so's book? Man, they got the, and we got the lingo. So I don't get impressed with lingo anymore. I don't, I don't get impressed with principles and sayings and thoughts and sermon titles. And, because if the story of the public, the Pharisee and the publican teaches me anything, there's more than meets the eye. There's always something more going on in the heart and that God doesn't judge the way that I judge. And that leads me to the tax collector, a.k.a. publican in some of your Bibles. Here's the shocking thing about the parable of the tax collector. It is impossible for me in modern lingo to put into words how low on the social totem pole the tax collector was in Jesus' day. They were the least moral person on the face of the earth. So I'm not even going to try to make a comparison that's fair because frankly, who am I to say who has low morals? So I'll let you do it. You don't have to say it out loud, but just pick somebody who's like the trash of the earth 
in the way they live their lives. Their moral code, the way they treat their neighbor, the way they treat their lives, the way they treat their body. Just pick it. Maybe it's drugs, maybe it's alcohol, maybe it's sex, maybe it's greed, maybe it's vice, maybe it's violence, maybe it's murder, maybe it's rape, maybe it's adultery. Maybe it's all of them in one big old fat, ugly ball. That's getting you close to the reputation of the tax collector. All right, now take that guy and bring him to your church. Bring him in all of his filthy glory. Bring him in, in whatever garbage that makes him garbage. He brings all of that with him to church. If it's drugs, if it's alcohol, maybe he comes in drunk. He comes in high. He comes in with three women on his arm. He comes in with a stolen car. He, whatever, I, I don't know. Insert your tax collector. And he walks in. Now, that's why I told you you would gladly choose the Pharisee when you build your membership role. There's no doubt about it. It looks better in the community. It's way more moral. Who in the world would want the tax collector? I'm trying to offend your sensibilities because that would get you close to how the crowd felt when Jesus told this story. That's the only way we'll really understand how they felt when he told this story is if I can come close to convincing you I've pushed it too far then you might get close to where they were. Because I promise you that when Jesus told this story, the crowd gasped and took a half step back from Jesus. You're surely not saying what it sounds like you're saying, because what it sounds like you're saying is the lingo and the morality didn't do anything. The guy that lives his life like a walking whore can walk into the presence of God hang his head, beat his breast, I'm a sinner, and he actually leaves with the justification the Pharisee worked all week to achieve, and the Pharisee leaves with none of that justification? This can't be the kind of church Jesus is trying to build. Now, I know you, and I know me, and you actually believe everything I just said, and you're okay with it because you believe in the grace of God. And yes, you are glad it's just a story, and God's not asking you to build a church around it. I'm with you. Although He's building a kingdom around it, with or without our help. But, we'll leave that aside for a moment. I just want you to notice that the reason why it lists off of the Pharisees' good works and lists none of the publicans' bad works is because it's a literary device. As good as you think the Pharisees' works are, the publicans are supposed to be equally opposite as bad. So whatever is great about the Pharisee is awful about the publican. He's not thankful. He has a bad posture before God. He doesn't know the lingo. He's not the Pharisee. Now, I told you before, and you can feel me heading to the end. Part of you, can, you can feel it because the story's over. But you can also feel it because you know there's something else here. Something that's just lingering below the surface that you know is kind of starting to nag you a little bit because you know there's a turn coming. And the turn is where I warned you at the top of this message. Be careful when you read this story that you have it figured out. And the reason why you need to be careful is because this is our instinct. We think that the Pharisee is the exception to the rule. Not all believers are this way. Just the really pious ones. Just the religious crowd. Just this crazy old Pharisee. So it's not everybody that comes into the temple like this. Jesus is just trying to show us what happens when religion goes bad. That religion gone to seed creates that kind of Pharisee and that juxtaposed against it, he'd show you'd be better off to just be a filthy old rotten sinner, the walk in hell, than it would be to be a religious individual. And you go, I can live with that. Yeah, that's exactly what Jesus is saying. But I'm here to tell you, be careful because there's more there than meets the eye. And let me say it this way, the Pharisee in this story is not the exception. The Pharisee in this story is the standard. You don't believe me? Then let me present for you a little quiz. I want us to imagine that we moved one week into the future past this story. 
And next week, it's time to go to temple again. And here comes the Pharisee. And here comes the publican. And in our little scenario, the publican went on being a publican. The tax collector went on being a tax collector. Now, I told you to pick all of the worst qualities you could find of a human being and wrap them into one person and make that the tax collector. So I want you to find that guy or that girl again in your head. And I want you to let them go out and do all of their filthy things for seven more days. You got it? There they go, out in town, living like hell. And they come back in next week. We're seven days into the future in the story of our Pharisee and our publican. And I want to ask you this. If he shows up next week in exactly the same manner, and he stands once again with his head hanging in front of God, and he beats his chest and says, have mercy on me, a sinner. What's God going to do in week number two? Have mercy. Good place to start, right? If the Pharisee does all of his Pharisee stuff, good morals, pays his tithes, doesn't cheat, doesn't rob anybody, doesn't extort anyone, walks in next week, glad he's not that publican, What's God's response to him? Is it the exact same as it was last week? God is never changing. That's the key to this part of the quiz. God is unchangeable. God justified one the week before for the same reason that God justifies the man the next week. Now, I saw you like that, so I'm going to change the quiz. All right? Let's swap it up again. Let's go another week into the future. Except this time, the publican got stuck into a Sunday school class this week that taught him some morals. He tried to do a little bit better. So this week, I want you to take your character. Remember the guy or the girl that you had that's the walk in hell, everything in the world wrong with them? Cut it in half. Maybe if it was drugs or alcohol or sex, they did 50% this week. Bless. Are you, are you with me? Cut, them in, cut it in half. They're getting better. In fact, one could say they're a lot better off this week than they were last week, right? Okay, seven days in the future, and we come back to church, and here comes our 50% better publican. And he stands in front of God, and he beats his chest, and he hangs his head, and he says, have mercy on me, a sinner. And what does God do? Have mercy. Have mercy. Is it more mercy than he had last week when they were at 100% tilt? Is it the same mercy that it was last week? The same mercy as when they were hell, as when they were trying to be heaven. And here's the kicker, and I told you we would miss it because we always miss that in this story. We, we, we actually like to clean the publican up because we admire the Pharisee. We just don't admire his attitude. And we think... The publican would be better off if he could live like the Pharisee and pray like the publican. That's the guy I want in church. Live like the Pharisee and pray like the publican. We got some grace. I'm here to tell you that the justification process of God ignored the Pharisee's good works and ignored the tax collector's bad works. That's the point of the story. Nothing you do matters for your righteousness. Only Jesus matters for your righteousness. Quiz number three. If when I told you that story, you thought, then the, publican, the Pharisee would be better off to go out and live just like the publican if they're both going to be justified anyway then I present to you that it's possible that you still don't understand what it means to be righteous. You're infatuated with what it would look like if you could get away with sin. Mm. That's good. Quiz number three is the one none of us want to take. <laughs> the reality is, is I don't want to live like either the Pharisee or the publican. I don't want to live a life so in love with my moral code that I bring it before the Lord and list off the good that I do in the world. Amen. I also don't want to live like the public and where every day of my life is hell and chaos. Amen. Where I'm ruining everything I touch. The point of the story is that we don't want to live either the life of the Pharisee or the publican. We want to receive the justification of Jesus. Out of the justification of Jesus, 
The life that we live is the life of God on the earth. And you don't get to decide what that looks like in your neighbor. What you do get to do is love your neighbor and believe that God, ready to pull Paul back in? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified freely by Jesus Christ. I don't get to tell God what all covers. I just love all that are His. And I accept my justification in Jesus, not in me. Let's land here with Peter in 1 Peter 5. I know we could stop right there. But I want to stop with a text from deep into the New Testament canon. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, Likewise, young people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Isn't it interesting how we love the stuff like young people submit to the older people, but then we ignore all of you submit to each other. <sighs> we fly right past that. The truth is, is that Peter's not trying to set up a, a, an age system of submission, but that we would submit to each other. Be clothed with humility because, look at this, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. How do you do that? Casting all your cares upon Him, for He cares for you. Cast your cares, not your performance. That's the beating of the breast to go, here I am, Lord can't do this. It's all you today. And he goes, justified. Not justified, go live like hell, but also not justified, go try to live like heaven. We need to say both. Because what we try to say to people is, you're justified, now don't go out there and live like hell and take advantage of grace. We ought to be saying the same thing to religious people. You're justified, now stop going out there trying to live like heaven and get God's approval. Because the reality is, is it ain't going to do you any good to go live like heaven any more than it would curse you to go live like hell in the eyes of God. And in fact, if you go out here and try to live like heaven, you'll probably end up despising all of the people that you don't think live like heaven. And if you go out here and live like hell, you're going to have enough hell to go around anyway. So in the end, wouldn't it be better to just be justified by believing on Jesus and let him do the rest? Out of that, then you go live the life that he has given you to live. I love this little parable. There's more there than meets the eye. I love that we get to come and stand before him and receive our justification not based on our good and not based on our bad. Because you're going to have both of them. None of them are going to do you any good. God doesn't choose the publican because he's a bad guy. God doesn't reject the Pharisee because he's a good guy. Those are our terms. God's justification comes when we submit to who he is. Here's what the Pharisee and the publican both needed to know, something I've been telling you for months. At the end of the day, they both have to die. At the end of the day, they both have to die. I'm not just talking physically, I'm talking spiritually. It's just that the publican comes in closer to it from the word go. And when you come in closer to it from the word go, grace goes down sweet. It's when we seek to live on our own through our merit that we choke on grace because we're so far from dying and we're pushing it away. And the reality is to accept that it is both the, the lot of the Pharisee and the publican and that the justification comes through accepting his death as your death and entering into it and then letting him live his life through you. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you today for what has been such a fantastic journey in Luke 18. I pray that we have done some form of justice to the story of the Pharisee and the publican, where we have muddied the waters. Father, help us to move past that and not let that germinate in our hearts, but where we have set Jesus and his justification in the highest possible light, may that take root and flourish in our soul. We don't want rewarded for our good any more than we want cursed for our bad. What we hope for is the justification that comes upon all because of Christ Jesus. And we realize that our righteousness is not through our performance, but through you and your finished work. 
We receive that in Jesus' name. Amen.